patentability requirements. These are pretty simple, kind of, to understand. Number one, novel. So this is what happens. You send off your uh, file wrapper to the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And the patent examiner, the, the lawyer there, is going to look at, is your patented idea novel? Does it have utility value? And is it non-obvious? Okay. Novel. Is it actually new or is this something that's old? Like, did someone make this and patent it 20 years ago? Or did they make it 20 years ago? They're going to do their best research to see if this has not been done before. Is, so is your invention new? That tends to be one of the easier factors, um, etc. Number two, utility value. Does it actually like work? <laughs> Does it do something? Does it perform a utility? It has to do something. It has to be, it doesn't have to be a lot. Like it, it, it can be very minimal, but it has to perform some sort of task. It has to do something. Like it has to do something. And the hardest hurdle, the most complicated hurdle to get over and to get your patent is non-obviousness, okay? You cannot just combine a bunch of things that existed. Your invention has to be an, in, an inventive leap. It cannot be obvious to um, your average person or, your in, or, or, or any inventor. It has to actually be something that, um, you know, shows that it's an inventive leap for what pre previously existed. So like, um, for instance, the mountain bike would not be patentable because you just took a bunch of things that exist in the public domain, bike parts and dirt bike parts, and you put them together to make something that is new and has use value, but like it's not an, in it's not an inventive leap. Now, if you used, if you figured out a way of using a bicycle to create uh, electrical energy, that's an inventive leap, you know? And so using bike parts and electrical parts to um, create electrical energy to power things could be considered an inventive leap. But just combining bike parts and motorcycle parts to essentially do what a bike or a motorcycle does, or, or dirt bike does, is it, it wouldn't make it over the non-obviousness uh, hurdle. So this is the toughest challenge for people filing for, 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 for patent. This is often why patents are denied. This is, you know, the uh, 19 out of the 20 that are often rejected is because um, they're not actually inventive leaps or they're not actually new. That in the fact that like someone had filed for patent on those things before or a patent exists on that before. Uh, or was filed for that idea before you. Okay, as I said, in 2013, there was two major Supreme Court decisions, um, Association for Molecular Pathology versus Myriad Genetics, and this was basically, can products of nature uh, be subject to patent? In this case, products of nature are things that are made in nature, which are human DNA. Is discovering human DNA just like discovering a frog in the Andes or discovering a... Uh, a, a new fruit tree in the wild, is that patentable subject matter? This is a Supreme Court case, okay, that was also being heard at uh, the same time as Bauman versus Monsanto Company. So these two major patent cases were in the Supreme Court at the same time, and, and what the Supreme Court ruled was, hey, listen, you know what? DNA is not patentable. You discovered it. You did not invent anything. You did not make something that's new. You just simply found something. That's not patentable. But you can patent cDNA, which is another type of DNA, which is, which is actually considered an, an invention. The other case was Bauman versus Monsanto. Monsanto had sued Bauman, who was a farmer. And Bauman, um, you know, had basically, um, basically saved seeds and replanted them. <clears throat> and he got caught by Monsanto. He was a farmer who got, who got caught. And he tried to say that, you know, the, the patent had exhausted, meaning he paid for the seeds and planted the seeds. The seeds yielded a crop. There, at that point, the patent had exhausted itself. He could save those seeds and replant them like farmers have done for centuries and centuries and centuries. 
This was his claim. He claimed what's called first sale doctrine or similar to first sale doctrine, which is this. When you buy a copyrighted record, vinyl album or DVD or Blu-ray, you can do anything with that physical thing. You can break it, burn it, give it away, sell it, use this record as a Frisbee, whatever. It exists in trademark too. You could buy a shirt with a trademarked logo on it. You could rip the sleeves off of it. You could, you know, paint on the logo. You could sell the shirt to Buffalo Exchange. You could donate it to Goodwill. You could give it to your friend when, you know, when you've outgrown it, whatever. That's for sale doctrine. In seed patents, he tried to claim the same thing. I bought the seeds. They did what they were supposed to do. I now own the seeds that came from that crop and I'm gonna plant them. The Supreme Court said, no. <laughs> okay, uh, you know, if you buy seeds that are patented seeds and you replant the seeds that come, that yield, that yield from, from the crop, you're infringing on Monsanto's patent, okay? Because those seeds in the first place are patented. As I said, when a commercial farmer buys, you know, tons and tons of seeds from Monsanto, they have to sign an agreement that says they won't infringe on the, on the patents. They won't save the seeds. Now, it's really hard to tell if seeds have been saved because sometimes you have crops that are non-Monsanto crops that, you know, and they get, the seeds get mixed in, and if you have a little bit of Monsanto seeds in there, like, they can still see you. I mean, there's literally people, like, that go in farming areas for Monsanto, and they test the genetics of people's plants to see if they're infringing on, on patent. And we see a little bit of, of, of this in the Seeds for Life uh, clip that, that, we, that we watch. So the Supreme, Supreme Court said, yes, you can, you can own genetically modified um, seeds, but not... You know, you couldn't go, um, you know, and patent apple seeds from an apple, but you could take apple seeds and you could make your own type of apple seed that were resist, that, that made apples that deterred worms, whatever. And those seeds would be patentable. Again, when you buy seeds that are patented, if I bought a bag of seeds or a little packet of seeds and those are patented seeds, when you open the pack of seeds, you are agreeing to the terms of the license, which is probably on small print on the back of the seeds that says you will not save um, the seeds. Now, you're, it's not a big deal if you're doing it in your little garden or whatever at your house, but if you're a commercial farmer saving seeds, Monsanto will sue you and fuck you up. All right, anyways, so those are the 2013 major Supreme Court decisions. It's a little bit about... Um, about patent and then next class we'll talk about licensing and we'll watch the film called patent absurdity i hope you're still awake you still awake this is the real dr dre here at goat's beard homestead i'll be back in a hot minute a few minutes and we'll get into uh licensing hold your anticipation hold it back all right i'm out pace <laughs>